duration of the uh, of the debates, and so uh, many of the people that uh, are involved in that contract are, are will be today in in this talk, and he's taking really multiple multiple angles, and um, so in a certain way we are celebrating uh, one. And, and celebrating not just the contract, but also the reunion of a research team that worked together many years on, on language translation, text translation, and now also in speech translation. So super happy to partner again with with uh, FBK, uh, with Per Voice, and an Alma Wave company that was a spin-off from, from FBK. So it's, um, it's another great opportunity to work together. Second thing um, is, a, is a great collaboration that is taking a different part of uh, the AI community back together. So to create new systems that connect uh, different domains, you, know, you need really to have specialty in different things. And so um, I'm happy that um, on this specific contract, we're coming together with, uh, with Pervoice that is do doing the um, automatic speech recognition I'm happy that Translated is doing the machine translation part, and uh, FBK that is building this model that actually connects two different AIs in a very smart way. So rather than just concatenating AIs, which is, uh, which is a possible but is not an optimal approach, we're really thinking about how to bring different verticals of AI into, into a more unified model. I mean, a very, very small step in the direction, if you want, of uh, general artificial intelligence. Um, so I'm happy uh, because we're bringing together these things. Uh, I'm happy because um, I see a lot of progress in the US in terms of uh, business around AI. I see a lot of improvement in China in terms of business of AI. But I also uh, I'm experiencing and I'm seeing uh, that we have a an incredible uh, growing research community in AI in Europe that is publishing uh, probably the biggest uh, part of the papers out there. So I'm super happy that, that this is happening and, and proves again that talent is uh, equally distributed on Earth and so opportunities also should be. Um, uh, there is a few more things before I, I move on with, with, the, with the event that I'm super happy today. So part of the people that uh, we worked with for many years um, uh, that have contributed to create some of the technology that we use today, Marcello, Federico, um, and Alex Weibel, uh, could not join today, uh, but I hope to have them in the, in the next event. They're both advisor of PyCampus, uh, but we have one uh, advisor that is joining today, uh, that is Hassan Sawaf, and I'm super, super happy um, uh, because uh, Pi Campus is a venture fund, first of all, and a venture fund in applied AI. And so the fact that Hassan was the director of AI at eBay, and then director of AI at Amazon, and then director of AI at Facebook, and now is launching its own startup in which Pi Campus is investing, uh, to us is a, is, a great, is a great, great news. And so, and so I wanted to pass a congratulation to, to Hassan for this uh, beautiful decision uh, of, of going back to be an entrepreneur. Um, so to move on with the, with the event, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Simone Scardapane, that is the chairman of the Italian Association of Machine Learning that is co-organizing this event with us and is also will be moderating the event. Thank you, Simone. Welcome everyone. This event again is uh, devoted to uh, spoken translation and the future of NLP and we will have two parts. So the first one is a keynote from Marco Turki and the second one will be a panel with uh, seven speakers including Marco Turki, Marco Trombetti, Hassan Sawaf and several others. So to begin with we have our keynote again. So Marco Turki is uh, one of the top researcher in Italy and in Europe about uh, spoken translation is leading the human machine translation group in Fondazione Bruno Kessler and before that he was a visiting professor in Bristol 
And before that, he took his PhD from the University of Siena. He's been invested in a lot of European projects, so we're very happy about this keynote. So Marco, please. To be here. So can I start and share my screen with the presentation? Please do. Okay, great. So, okay, so. Okay, can you see fine? Simone, can you see everything fine? Yes. Okay, good. So first of all, thanks a lot for inviting me. I want to thank first of all the campus and uh, the Italian Association for Machine Learning, and in particular Marco, Sebastien and Simone. Among all possible NLP tasks today, I will present our activity on spoken language translation. And in particular, I will focus on how the AI revolution that we are living nowadays has affected, has changed the research in spoken language translation. What I'm going to present today is clearly part of the collaboration that we, that I have, of course, with the Machine Translation Group in the FBK. So I will try to explain what and why spoken language translation is, is and why it's important. I will try to show how AI has changed this field in the last five years. And then I will start to show you some experiment where we compare the standard approach, which is the cascade with a new technology. And then I will present two use cases where I, in addition to require the quality, we also to see how the two technology deal with two particular problems. One is the gender bias, and the other is to how to manage to produce proper subtitles. And then I will conclude my presentation with the open problems. So when we talk about spoken language translation, we have a, an audio in one language we want to translate. The output can be a text or can be an audio as well. And in my presentation, I will focus on the first condition. So I have a person speaking in Chinese, I pass the audio through a machinery and it produces a text in a target language. Of course, this can be also a proxy for speech to speech translation if I connect a text to speech and I pass through it the translated text. This uh, research topic has attracted a lot of the academy and for, for this kind of another research talk, let's consider that the first paper are in the 80s about the spoken language translation. And of course, some a lot, some and prestigious universities work and contribute to develop interesting and important uh, systems. Recently, but we say in the last decades, uh, also big companies start to think and start to develop their own system for producing speech-to-text translation. And now, if you go in the, the say the resources of these big company, there is always a service which includes a speech-to-text translation. The main reason is that uh, nowadays there are a lot of conditions where we need services for helping people to communicate. For instance, you are going in a country where you don't speak the language and you would like to have a device that uh, take an input the voice and produce the text in the target language. Another prominent, is, prominent field application is the live broadcasting, where someone is speaking on the screen and you want to understand what he's saying because you don't understand the language. And an important sub, sub area of live broadcasting is subtitling. Where I, in this slide, I had a, a movie, a picture from a movie, but when I talk about subtitling, I'm not only thinking about movies, but I think also of millions of YouTube videos that there are available and for which there are, there are not subtitles or for which you don't understand the language, but you are interested in the topic. So there is a big market there. And the last one, which probably is most recent application is the house home device, where you speak to the device and the device should perform an action. If the, the, you speak a language that is not understood by the device, that's an issue. So what happening probably inside is that uh, there are natural language understanding processing tools in most common language, let's say English, and there is internally a service that translate the audio, for instance, in Russian into English, and then is used by the device to perform the action. Of course, this is very short list of possible application, 
So all these things make the spoken language translation field quite interesting, both for the academic and for the industry. So if you think about spoken language translation, of course, you cannot ignore the two parent tasks. The first task is automatic speech recognition, and the other one is machine translation. Let's try to see what is the relation between these two tasks and spoken language translation. So in automatic speech recognition, you have a content, let's say a sentence, I love wrong, that you need to, trans that you need to translate. Of course, what makes peculiar the, the problem is that uh, when you have an audio, the audio main does not only depend on the content, but depend on a lot of factors, the background, the, the voice of the speaker, the age of the speaker, the tone of the speaker. So even if you have only one content to communicate, the system need to deal with several different audios. And the nice thing is that you need to produce only one out because there is only one transcription. And this makes the task quite challenging. On that side, you have machine translation, where the input is a sentence, is a textual sentence. That, in most of the cases, is completely ignore the surrounding on the costing content information. And when you translate, you have several possible translations that are all of them correct. And they choose the decision of what is the correct one may depend on the context. That, in most of the cases, is not available in the textual sentence. So the difficulty here is to look what is the most suitable translation given the textual sentence. Of course, creating, assuming that they have the right translation. When you think about spoken language translation, you start from an input which is similar to ASR. So for each one content that you want to communicate, you have several factors that make an audio different from the other. When you translate, you are more similar to machine translation. Because now, in the target language, you can have several possible correct translations of the same. And the difficulty here is to find the, the good ones. That probably is the more appropriate for the context that can be, for instance, the background, the voice, and so on. So Let me say that spoken language translation inherits the most difficulties of the parent task. But on one side, it's, it's include in the audio much more information that can make the, the decision of the best station somehow simple. So the classic approach that, uh, that has been developed to address the problem of spoken language translation is the so-called cascade, where given an audio, you have a pipelines of tools that are concatenated. Each of them take the output of the previous one and produce a new output. We can let me say group the tools in two big parts, the audio part and the textual part. In the audio part, we have automatic speech recognition that convert the audio into the text in the same language. The audio is not segmented in the sense that there is no distinction between words, also because the, the, the audio is a continuum of words. If, if you look at what I'm saying now, there are a few pauses in what I'm saying. And then there is a fixed temporal relation between the audio and the text. So the first part of the audio is, a, is a connected with the first part of the transcription. So this is quite clear. There is not, let me say, a reordering or change of order between the, the spoken word and the transcribed word. In machine translation, it should convert the output of the automatic transcription uh, the, 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 of the ESR into target language. In this case, we are dealing only with text, and the text is segmented because it's split in words. But different from the ESR, you don't have one possible, only one possible translation, uh, transcription, but and then there is also the possibility of need of performing some change of word or word in the target language. Just let me give an example. If I have the source language is English and I translate in German, I need to move the verb from the middle of the English sentence at the end. Of course, changing the target language, you change also the grammar constraint that your system should learn and should satisfy when you produce uh, the translation. Different from the ESR, you need to deal with two vocabularies, the vocabulary of the source language and vocabulary of the target language. So make the vocabulary large. So what are the advantages of this, of this cascade approach? Of course, it's a consolidated technology. 
is uh, almost 40 years that people are improved the technology and are obtaining amazing results. The, the good thing is that can, being the ASR and the MT separated, you can take the state of the art of the two models and put in your production. And AI also have a lot of data that you can leverage for training your system, also because the training are independent. First you train in ASR and then you train in machine translation system. Unfortunately, there are also some problems that we need to solve. The main problem is the call error propagation. So if the ASR performs some errors, these errors are amplified by the machine translation system. And this means that the translation can be completely uncorrelated with the input, the input sound, the input out. When we transcribe, in most of the cases, we lost some important peculiarity of the audio. For instance, prosodic cue, or for instance, information about the gender of the speaker. And the fact that you need to maintain two systems, this is a problem because we have two systems running, and also you can introduce some latency when you translate from one the audio to the text. So now I just give you a very brief, brief introduction of what has been done before. Now let's talk about what is the impact of the uh, artificial intelligence era we are living now on spoken language translation. So AI is everywhere. Isn't, isn't, we cannot uh, say this is not true. For instance, a machine learning system can analyze your, your X-ray, car are driven by neural networks, and uh, you can also have, uh, uh, for instance, better uh, weather forecasting using neural network. And the last that I like more, you can ask a machine to watch a basketball game, and the machine can easily identify all the plays of the two teams. So this is also used in practice by the single teams for discover the plays of the other of the other teams. So AI is everywhere. Of course, AI is in neural network, deep learning neural network has been also already applied in the cascade because the ASR, and in particular the machine translation system, are based on neural network. Let me say that the use of neural network in machine translation create create a really important quantum leap. That, uh, of course, improving the performance both of the ASR and the MT also improve the performance in general on speech to text translation. But this, more, this uh, idea of the neural network that take an input and produce an output can be applied to introduce what is called the end to end spoken language translation system, where starting from an audio, you can directly produce a text in the target language. This is thanks to the call sequence to sequence model. These are uh, architecture that take an input, a sequence. They encode the sequence in a, a big list of numbers. This number is passed to the recorder that by magic produce a translated text. It's, I know that it's very difficult to understand that these things works, but uh, in practice, this produces a big advance, advancement in technology. When applied to the end to end, you can clearly, you don't have anymore the problem of the error propagation because you have one single system that can process everything directly. And the interesting feature is that the decoder can directly access to the audio during translation. And then you have, if you think about the application of this technology in production, you have only one single system to maintain and not anymore two or more than two. Unfortunately, again, if there is a, one side of the slide with the pro, there is also the other side of the, other side of the slide with the cons. This is a new approach, so of course require some more investment before bringing them at the production level. And one important problem is the scarcity of training data. If in the cascade I can leverage the ASR and T data here, the data that you need for training your mod require the out and the tar and the text in the target language, and these are not always available. Again, similar to the MT, even here you have the problem that you need when you translate you need to probably reorder the sequence of the word compared with the initial input, uh, input speech. This means that the encoder, different from the ASR, should not, not, should not only be able to understand the main information about the audio and the text that is being pronounced in the audio, but how to understand how it can be uh, reordered during the translation process. So it's, it seems to be another task. 
So let's start from the first challenge. As I say, when you want to uh, train in the spoken language and speech text system, you have the audio in one language and the text in the other language. If you think around you, probably this, this kind of inform type of data is not super common. If I think at machine translation, I can see a lot of books written or translated in few languages. If I think about for ASR, it's quite normal, let me say that for some audio, there is the need of transcribing it. For spoken language translation, this is an issue. So the research try and the, the issue is quite important because of course, this I, I made by myself this lab, so I don't have proper number, but I know that for machine translation system, we can think about 100 million of sentence pairs. For ASR, you can think about tens of hundred, tens of million of uh, uh, pairs of data. For SLT, the quantity we are talking about 200,000. So you can see the degree of magnitude is very, very different. So the research start to push a lot in investigating this problem. The most obvious things was to produce new data sets. So in FBK, we released the MASI, which is one of the largest data set for spoken language translation. Then in some colleagues in Spain developed Europal ST, Facebook produced the cover. So there is some tendency to release data, but the amount of data that are released by this data set is still limited. So one important aspect, or one important strength of research in speech to text translation is the need of leverage ASR and MT data when training the end to end system. This pushed the community to focus on several directions. The most obvious is to produce artificial data, so data augmentation. So you can have the machine translation data and you can ask someone to read the data. Or you can have ASR data and you can ask someone to translate the transcription data. There has been based also technique that focus on training in ASR with ASR data in machine translation with the machine translation data and then take the encoder and the decoder of the two models and merge them together starting the training already from a pre-trained model. And then there are more sophisticated techniques like knowledge distillation, multitask and transfer learning. Just to give you an idea, if you have a limited amount of data in several language pair, you can train a single SLT system on all these data set, hoping that similar language can help each other to improve the encoder or the decoder. This is classic transfer learning approach. Another problem that already previously mentioned is that, for instance, in any sub, we say that we have a normal input and we have a monotonic, a monotonic, monotonic output. In machine translation, we have a short input, which is, by the way, is segmented at word level. But I need, I need to try to swap the uh, order of the output to meet the constraint given by the target language. In spoken language translation, let me say I have both because I have a long input which is the audio, and then it will produce a reordered output. So these require several activities, in particular on how to let the, the technology to deal with this very long input. So some approach, they focus on uh, applying some technique for reducing the input. Of course, these are the cost of loss of information. Other try to define or introduce specific loss, in most of the case imported from the uh, speech recognition community, and as well, they also use multitask learning. Other direction, they focus on, okay, I have this data, but can I can I use in a better way this data? One is the using the ESA data, for instance, for pre-training the model. Another approach is the called instance-based adaptation, where you have an audio that you want to translate, you look in your training data, what are the most similar audio, and you fine tune your system on this one. So what you're trying to do is that, you can really uh, focus the, your network on that particular input. So this is just a very super quick uh, overview about what is the, the need, what, we, what has been done in terms of research. But let's start to see what are the performance of these two objects, the end-to-end -end and the cascade. So I will present the result that uh, uh, come. One is from the International Workshop of Spoken Language Translation, and one from some comparative evaluation that we run internally at FBK. 
So the IWSLT uh, workshop is one of all this kind of evaluation campaign for spoken language translation. And in turn to the workshop, we organize the offline SLT task, which means that we provide the participant the audio in English and also the text in German. And we ask them to produce the translation of a blind test set. And then we uh, evaluate all the submission using automatic methods. These are the results on, uh, of like this year evaluation. So in, uh, in the table, you can see the, the cell with the blue background, they are the entrance system, while the white background, they are the uh, cascade. So as you can see, in both the cases, the end-to-end -end approach and some cases have slightly better performance than the cascade. Of course, as they gain, of the end-to-end -end compared to Cascade is marginal, so it's not, it's not a game. But what is important compared to last year, when the, the Cascade was 2, 2.5 blue score point ahead the end-to-end, -end, this year, the new technology proposed by the participant showed that the end-to-end -end has arrived at a point where it's approached the performance of the Cascade. That was, I think this is an important uh, achievement for the community. We were not happy, uh, let's say, at every performance only on one language, so we extend the evaluation on two more languages, English, Spanish, and English, Italian. And we compare the, two, uh, the cascade and the end-to-end. -end. One thing that is important to, uh, to, to remember is when the end-to-end, -end, compared to the cascade, is trained on much, much less data. So already a rich approach in the performance of the cascade is, my opinion, is already a super interesting and amazing result. But let's look what happened with the other languages. So as you can see, the blue score means the larger, the better. Even in this case, our evaluation confirmed the performance that we have at RBSHT. Of course, for Spanish, the cascade is slightly better, but this performance is not significant. So doesn't make the, we can say that the two systems are on par. Honestly speaking, we were not really happy uh, because we know that the automatic metric sometimes does not tell us the truth. So we, first of all, we compute, we use the, the translation error rate, the TR, which is a metric used to evaluate the uh, output of the automatic system against the human posterity. And initially we compare about the reference. The reference is a, a, a correct translation that is generated independently from the translation of the system. When we look at the performance, we confirm the cascade and twin are similar, but the, the TR was very high. So let's, our impression was, okay, this output is not usable by the human. So we decided to check if this our intuition was correct. So we took a subset of this data and we asked two independent professional translators to post edit. And then we compute the TR against the post edit. With our big surprise is that the output of the human is that it will compute against two posterities. Okay? There was an important reduction in, uh, in TR, which means there was a big improvement in performance, showing that the quality of the two systems, cascade and end-to-end, -end, were revealed to be quite good. Of course, we start talking at TR, which is around 25, so it's not something like we can have in machine translation, where the TR is around 11, but still this tells us that the two system, the output of the system is usable by the prospectors. The, the other thing, this is the human evaluation confirmed that the end to end is on par with the cascade. So not only the automatic metrics say that, but also the evaluation with, with the humans. Of course, these require more and different evaluation. And let's consider that this is a laboratory experiment. So we need to extend this, but at least this analysis revealed that the end-to-end -end finally achieved the performance of the cascade. So now uh, we decide to also to go further and to try to understand what make the end-to-end -end so interesting. So we decide to compare the cascade end-to-end -end in two different use cases, where the important thing is not only the translation quality, but there is something more. And these two tasks is the mitigating the gender bias in speech translation and producing subtitles that are conform to length constraint. I will explain a bit more in the next slide 
what I'm saying here. So, uh, in general, when you have a learning system, it learns from the data. So, if the data they are green, the system became green. If the data are yellow, the system became yellow. This means that the system exactly extrapolate all the information that are in the data. If this information has a bias, the system has a bias. Let's have a look at, uh, so the larger data that we have for our evaluation come from TED Talks and the debate of the European Parliament. In the TED Talks, 70% of the speakers are male, and in the European Parliament, in the optimal condition, there was only 40% of women representation there. So this means that most of the data that we are using are generated by male speakers. So let's go a bit deeper to analyze what's happened in, in this condition. So I need a volunteer that can help me with the quiz time. I don't know, Marco Trombetti, do you want to help me? I don't hear anyone. Okay, so I don't- Can you hear my microphone, microphone now? Yeah, okay, Marco, okay, thanks perfect. a lot. So, Okay, so I need your help. It's a very super difficult task, so I know, but you can do it. So, okay. Oh, so let's assume that you have this English sentence, and uh, you have Italian speaker. So you can can you tell me what is the best relation between the two on the right? If what there is, is the one. best Italian translation for "I'm a good friend"? Sono una buona amica. Yes. Sono un buon amico. Uh, it's there is not a single one. Exactly. That's that's exactly the point. Both of them are good translation. Both, yeah, both right? are good. Okay. Good answer. Plus one for Mark. So uh, what's happened if I ask you, according to the what uh, I wrote at the beginning of this slide, what do you think is the most probable automatic translation produced by a machine, A or B? Um, well, it depends on the training data, but I, I guess... Uh, I, I, I don't know. I think maybe I'm buon amico. So it was maybe yes. the masculine. Exactly, because as you say, most of the data contain male speaker. So that's that's fine because both the translation are correct. But what's happened if the speaker and that's okay, but what's happened if the speaker is female? Is still be the correct translation? No. No. Thanks Marco for for your help. So this means I know it was it was a super difficult task. So I know that I know that it can do that. So this is exactly the gender bias. So what is happening in uh, Marco? I have the echo. Can you? Okay. So this is exactly the concept of the Marco. I hearing the echo in my microphone. Can you switch off the? Okay. Okay. So thanks, thanks Marco for the help. So this is exactly the concept of gender bias. As, and this is happening in a lot of NLP tasks. So this means that the machine learns from the data. If the data, for some reason, they have a bias, the machine will have a bias. So just to give an example, this happened in several NLP tasks that also Google, they develop a new, a new version of Google Translate where they produce two different translations. One in case you are a male and one in case you are a feminine. So let's say what we would like to do is to check what is the capability of the end-to-end -end and the cascade to deal with the gender bias. So for that, we use the massive corpora that we developed, where you have an audio, you have the translation of the sentence, and each of these pairs contain a gender issue. Then we took the, the correct translation, which in this case for the fem female speaker is sonostata, and then we generate the wrong one, where we change the gender of the word that marked the gender. In this case, stato became stata became stato. And then we compute the performance of the two systems, and we check the performance on the wrong reference. If the system has high performance on the wrong reference, this means that he has a biased behavior toward the wrong reference. So let's have a look at our results. So let's start from the feminine. In this case, the speaker is feminine. So if you look at the cascade, the cascade has super high performance on the wrong reference. This means that in most of the case, when you need to use a feminine version of the translation, it generates a masculine one. While the end to end is really much more biased, a much more balanced in the behavior. So you can see 
that on the left side of the first figure, the performance are more or less exactly the same. Of course, you still have an error in the because the wrong is very high, but still you have much more balanced behavior. If you look in the masculine, it's the same. The cascade still being good in generating the correct one, it still have a bias to generate something wrong. Also in the with the wrong reference. While that one is able to maximize the performance on the masculine class. This show us that apart from the translation quality, the, the capability of the end-to-end -to, -end to direct access to the, to the audio, giving the possibility to use the information during translation and leverage speaker vocal tones from the audio. So this gives plus one to the end-to-end -end compared to the cascade. Now let's move to the second uh, example that we have, and this is related to subtitle. Okay. So in subtitling, so probably most of the audience knows these things better than me, but in subtitling, you have some constraint that you need to uh, satisfy when you generate subtitles. You know, cannot have more than two lines, and you have each uh, subtitle should long for 42 characters per line. And then there is also the need of not having more than 25 characters per second. Because if you have a very super long subtitles, then you don't have time to read it while watching the movie. So this is the way how, given a, a text a string, you can split a, a text into subtitles. You have two kinds of tags that you want to add. The end of block, which tell you that the subtitles stop here, and the end of line that split the subtitles in two lines. In this sentence, the human decide to add the end of block under women and the end of line after inter, producing the subtitle that you see here on the, on the left. But this is not the only possibility because you can also add the end of line after women and the end of block after internet, producing another reasonable subtitle. Of course, the decision between what is the correct subtitle between left and right depends on a lot of facts. Creating a subtitle is a multimodal process, which should take in consideration the audio, the video, and a lot of factors. And the translator that generates subtitle, they are creators, they are artists. So what we want to test here is the capability of the end-to-end -end and the cascade, not only to translate the sentence, but also to properly generate subtitles. So to include during translation, the end of long, the end of line, and the end of block. So in the cascade, you have the ESL, they transcribe. While you translate, you force the empty system to add the two tags. The same, we do the same also for the end-to-end, -end, where we don't have, of course, the intermediate step, but it generates as well a translation with end of line and end of line. So these are the performance in terms of blue score here on the two language direction, English, French, and English, German. So similar to what we saw before, Again, it's clear that the end-to-end -end reach the performance of the, of the cascade. But let's look, so we isolate a subset of sentences that contain more than one subtitle, and then we check the capability of the two systems to locate the end of block and the end of line in the right position. Of course, this evaluation is, is difficult because the two systems can generate translation that are completely different, but we look at the position in terms of word. So it is uh, the end of block should be after the third word, it is there, right? No, it's wrong. What you can see here, but although the two systems achieve quite remarkable performance, what is interesting is that the end to end can uh, slightly outperform the cascade. So we try to understand, this was for us very interesting result, and we try to understand why, what is happening there. And then we notice that the position of the end to end, the, of the sorry, of the end of block, end of line, is strongly correlated with the poses in time in, in the audio. So what we notice that the capability of the end to end again to directly access the audio, giving the possibility to learn that when there is a pause, so there is not speech, the system should add the end of line and end of block. So even in this case, we confirm that. The, our assumption that accessing the audio during translation is a benefit, in practice it is. So I have several examples, but I think I don't have time to go through it, so I will uh, skip them. So, uh, yes, because I think I'm also late. So let's now see what where we are. 
So we have seen in my presentation that uh, the AI revolution allow us to move further from the cascade and to address the problem of spoken language translation as an end-to-end -end system. In terms of performance, at least in this controlled environment, the end-to-end -end approach the cascade. And the fact that end-to-end -end can leverage directly the audio gives several benefits. We have seen in the gender bias and the generation of subtitles. But what are the so done, we are happy, the, the problem is solved, not at all. There are several problems we want to be able to solve. First of all, if I want, if you, if you notice, in all my experiments, I have English as a source language. This is one of the limitations that we have. So it's very, almost impossible at this point to translate, for example, from German to French, because there are not freely available data. So we cannot scale to any languages right now. We cannot, uh, the system that we train, we test is in, in one domain, but if you want to have a system that is more general purpose, that can work well in several domains, at the moment, this is not feasible. The system are not able to do that. Of course, this is something that the research should address, but we are far from that. Another problem is sometimes when you are, for instance, in production, you don't want only the translation, but you want also additional information. If you think about subtitling, you want also the timestamp and the transcription. And these things at the moment is not addressed from the research community. The last problem that I think related to what Marco said at the beginning of this event is that in, uh, now in my experiment, I have the, the test set is accessible so I can process it. But when you deal with the speech, of course, what you want to have is something in real time. So while I'm speaking, I am translating. Of course, this can be addressed with the spoke with the cascade. There are some work that start to address this also for the end to end. But this is a very interesting and challenging scenario. So what I'm trying to say is that in now I think we show in several occasions that the end to end in some condition can approach the cascade. Now it's time to take it out from the lab and start to think how we can use in production. Of course, this is an activity that should include the academy, but it should also, <clears throat> is also important for the industry. So I think this is another occasion where the industry and the academia can cooperate for producing something which something better. So let me uh, conclude my presentation, say that as we, we know already, AI has given, create new opportunities that we have seen has been addressed in a lot of NLP tasks. Nowadays, most of the state of the art include neural network and AI. So also in a spoken language translation, the, uh, the arrival of neural network has, has brought some important improvement. And showing, and we show, and showing that it's possible to make a test new task with the end-to-end -end technology, showing interesting possibilities. Of course, we are at the beginning of a very long and curvy road, but in my, my opinion, we clearly address the right problem and we are we took the right direction. So I before concluding, I want to thank the machine translation team at FBK, all the work that I presented, and of course, in collaboration with them. So if you are interested in any of the activity I present, feel free to drop me a line and we'll be happy to point you out to our publication, our activity. So that's all on my side and thanks a lot to everyone for your attention. And I just want to mention that this activity has been partially funded by an Amazon grant and that's from the European Association and for machine translation grant. So thanks a lot everyone for your attention. Thank you, Marco, for the very interesting keynote. Uh, I think we have a lot of things uh, to discuss. So we invite everyone to make questions if you want on our live uh, streaming channels. We already have a few of them. So I'll read from the, from the live stream. So the first one they're asking that, well, Google Translate already has a pretty high accuracy right now. It, it's been highly advertised also. So do you think there's place uh, to enhance by a good margin the accuracy? I think so. I mean, uh, I think so. In particular, the the important aspect that uh, is that uh, Google Translate is a let me say a general purpose machine translation system with a super good performance. But if you think about the localization sector, 
sorry, I heard my my dad. Oh, sorry. Okay, so okay, thanks. So if you think, for instance, at uh, uh, the localization market, where you need to deal with very domain specific uh, document or to be translated, I think there there is a lot of margin and it's possible to improve the performance of this already super good system in very specific context. So the answer is yes. Yeah. Uh, our live feed. So, uh, do you have any advice on how you could build a data set for end to end uh, uh, speech to speech translation actually from scratch? Yeah, that's a very interesting and challenging question. For, so, uh, in, uh, when we build this, this speech to text translation, we leverage the TED Talks. So, you have the audio, the transcription, and the translation. And that was quite straightforward. For speech to speech, that uh, is a problem because you cannot use the TED Talks because the TED Talks are available only in one language. Hey, that's that's a very challenging problem. So what has been uh, seen, and it's more on the industry, is possible to ask human. So you can take the parallel data, so the machine translation parallel data, and ask human to read the sentence in the source and in the target language. Of course, this is. Uh, expensive, but uh, let me say that at the moment, it seems to be the only way to generate uh, uh, data for speech for speech, for speech to speech. Uh, at, at the moment, I said, I don't have any in mind any audio that is produced in more languages. So that's the real problem. The problem is to have an audio, the same audio that is uh, available in two languages. So the only thing that comes to my mind at the moment is to sim generate artificially. Especially in Italy, there are, well, we have a lot of variation in how we talk actually from each uh, town to each other town. So how much does this affect this kind of system? So especially the end-to-end -end compared to the cascade one, how, how difficult is it to, to find data on, on these variations? Uh, this, this is one of the big challenges. Then that's very difficult. That's when I, when I mentioned that we need to take the technology to the lab and bring it into the industry, this is one of the main obstacles. Because if you are a company that want to have a, one of these systems live, you need to deal with uh, dialect, uh, language variation, uh, background noisy, and this is what makes really the difference. And uh, yeah, that's very challenging and it's very difficult for for the current system to deal with, uh, uh, with these things. Just to give you an example, uh, now that most of the research conference are online, we need to prepare a slide and we have to we need to, to, to present the speech over the slide. So what I did, I took one of the uh, this presentation from one of my students, and I passed through on one of these systems that uh, transcribe and translate. And it was very fun. It was very fun because, uh, of course, this guy has a good English, but he's not a native speaker. And when you pass this system through an English system, the performance are quite, honestly, quite poor. So this uh, is a quite important research area in end to end speech translation and also in automatic speech recognition. a great keynote and I think we can move because we're running a little bit short on time on the second part of our event. So now we have a panel where we'll talk a little bit more about speech translation, automatic speech translation, and also what we can gather on the future of natural language processing. And we have Marco Turki with us and six other speakers actually. So the panel is divided into two parts. In the first part, we'd like to give you a tour of some great international and international projects on uh, spoken translation. And we'll do a tour of Europe first. We have several speakers with us and we'll conclude by going overseas. And we have a Sansa Waf who will describe his own project. So I think we can start actually by Laurent Bessassier, who's a computer science professor at the University of Grenoble Alpes. And previously he was a visiting researcher at the IBM Watson Research Center, and he's involved in leading the OnTrack project, we'll, which he'll describe. So, Laurent? Thank you. 
Um, can you see my screen? Not, Not yet. yet. Yes. Yes. Yes, we see it. Okay. So um, my plan was to speak for uh, two, three minutes about um, what is actually a national project uh, called On Track. Uh, uh, but uh, it's a project in order to participate to international uh, shared tasks and evaluation campaigns. So um, um, the thing is that uh, this uh, the, every year there's a um, shared task on spoken language translation, so the task that was just described by Marco. And uh, participating to this task is very demanding in terms of human resources and also in terms of uh, computational resources. So. What we did uh, in French, we built this uh, small consortium of three labs uh, called OnTrack, uh, and it includes so my lab in Grenoble and also a, a laboratory of informatics in Avignon and a lab in Le Mans. And we decided to participate jointly to uh, this uh, spoken language translation evaluation shared task. Uh, so uh, this year um, uh, there was um, there we participated to two tasks. One is about offline translation track, and we, we built end-to-end -end models for English to German. Uh, I will not talk about this because I think uh, Marco uh, talked a lot already about this end-to-end uh, -end versus cascade uh, comparison. Uh, but I will. we were very interesting because for the first time this year, there was a, a, a simultaneous translation track, and I'm going to talk about it for the remaining two minutes uh, quickly. So let me uh, just introduce this uh, this task. As it was organized by uh, by people from Facebook uh, this year, and so uh, in the in the conventional offline uh, translation, uh, basically we read a sentence. So uh, we read a sequence. Uh, so in the source language, and this sequence can be. A a sequence of words if we are doing a conventional machine translation, or it can be a sequence of uh, speech frames if we are interested in, uh, in speech translation. But we read the full sequence before starting to uh, translate it in, into the target language. So somehow we, we have this, this pass in the source to target uh, matrix uh, representation. And what is interesting with the uh, online or simultaneous translation is that you want to um, start decoding uh, the target language uh, while not having access to the full uh, input. So for instance, in this example you have here, um, this is called a wet three pass because you start reading three words or three frames uh, before um, outputting an output uh, in the target language, and then you alternate between reading and writing, um, so reading the source or writing the, the target. Um, and in the uh, so this weight K uh, strategy was uh, introduced uh, uh, recently, and in the first uh, research is um, uh, you you. At training time, you 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 needed to uh, design the uh, the strategy in advance uh, to know um, for a specific delay. So, for instance, here you have a delay of three words, and you you it was needed to uh, to train a system uh, for a specific delay, uh, and it could not be applied to to another delay or to another uh, function point of the system. So what we try to do during the, um, uh, the this year evaluation was, was to um, train a single model uh, with uh, that was able to work well with different uh, latency uh, regimes. So for this, we uh, we did a, a, a quite a simple strategy where for each training epoch and for every batch of uh, of of, uh, of of training data. Uh, we sample a specific uh, pass, so a specific delay, uh, was it with different value of k, k being the number of look-ahead words we, we want to, um, to, um, to investigate. And then uh, we optimized um, uh, our model over all those different kinds of, uh, of, uh, of uh, strategies uh, in order to have a single system that is able to uh, translate well for different latency regimes. 
So I don't want to detail too much uh, the results we obtained at the IWSLT 2020 evaluation campaign, but what you can um, maybe uh, look at the right, the figure on the right, and what is interesting to see is that a single model uh, obtained those results that you see on the on the blue on the or on the uh, red curves, um, and for different latency regimes. So here, generally, when we do a simultaneous translation, we evaluate a trade-off between a performance, which can be measured, for instance, with a blue score, and between uh, uh, something called average lagging, which is some, something that has to do with the delay that is introduced. So when, when you have one second, that means that you really start uh, translating with only one second of signal, and when you are at two seconds, you have more, um, more input before starting to translate, and of course, it has an impact on the performance. But um, what the lesson we learned from this is was that um, it's possible with a single model to obtain uh, um, a very good trade-off between performance and uh, latency. Uh, and we did that uh, so far with a cascade model. So uh, it was a cascade between ASR and uh, and MT. But uh, in um, our plan is really to work now on an end-to-end -end model for low latency, uh, which is uh, quite uh, challenging. So that's all I have for uh, for um, for today. Uh, it was a very short pr presentation about uh, simultaneous translation. Okay, thank you, Laura. So stay there because we're coming back to you sure. in the second round of our panel. Now we can switch to uh, come back to Italy, actually, because we have with us Dario Franceschini, who's the CTO of uh, Peer Voice and is a partner in two different European projects, Ubridge and Elytra. So I, I'd like him to describe the two projects now. We cannot hear you. Sorry, forgot to unmute my microphone. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and thank you for this opportunity to speak about uh, our experience uh, in the field of uh, NLP, and uh, in particular, the speech recognition and machine translation. I'm Dario Franceschini. I, I hope you see my presentation. Uh, please let me know if uh, you can see it. Yes. OK. Uh, so I'm Dario Franceschini, the CTO of Pervoice. Uh, and uh, we as per voice uh, uh, took part uh, in the past decade into two major European funded projects. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, UBridge, uh, whose uh, complete name was uh, Bridges Across Language Divide, and uh, the uh, recent one, uh, Eliter, the European Live Translator, where uh, we are uh, partnering with major speech recognition, machine translation, and spoken language translation uh, research institutes uh, uh, across uh, uh, Europe. Just So when uh, Ubridge started in uh, 12, 2012, uh, we defined four major use cases to tackle with uh, during the project. Uh, the first one was the, ca the captioning and translation of specific TV broadcast programs like the BBC weather forecasts. Then uh, the other one was to provide live transcription and translation. So we are talking about uh, spoken language translation, in fact, of university lectures. Then uh, coming back to the European Parliament uh, that has been introduced at the very beginning to provide support to interpreters at the EU Parliament and provide automatic transcription and translation of voting session. And then, last but not least, uh, to introduce automatic transcription and translation in online webinar using a unified communication platform uh, provided by one of our partners. At that time, but I would say not only at that time, uh, these tasks were challenging. And uh, consider that in 2012, uh, the uh, introduction of neural networks uh, for speech recognition was, was at a very early stage. Uh, and as far as I remember, there's one no uh, neural network-based machine translation, so only statistical machine translation was uh, were available at that time. So during the project lifetime, uh, we introduced neural network uh, in the speech recognition, uh, but uh, we had no chance to have uh, neural machine translation uh, applied to the use cases. Uh, Despite of that, we successfully achieved the all project goals uh, and uh, improved the technology both in speech recognition and machine translation. 
So let's go to Elita. And a uh, lot, of, lot of time uh, passed since uh, 2015 when uh, your bridge ended. Uh, speech recognition evolved to, uh, toward the uh, end-to-end speech recognition system, uh, but, sti but still work is in progress in this task. And regarding machine translation, Marco already gave us a comprehensive overview of the status and of the history of uh, machine translation. So in uh, 2018, we started designing a more challenging project uh, to submit to you to push the speech recognition and, mach and machine technology a step forward. As a consequence, a leader was born. Uh, if uh, your bridge goal was to build bridges across language divide, the goal of a leader is to remove communications barrier. So in a leader, our goal is to advance speech recognition, machine translation, and spoken language translation to make real-time communication possible across languages, both in face-to-face -face conversation and uh, live and online conferences. So to make data available, to make uh, the content available simul in multiple simultaneous languages. So in a little, we are researching on many NLP-related topics uh, like end-to-end real-time speech recognition, and I want to stress real-time because it's uh, a challenging task, uh, multi-language machine translation, end-to-end -end spoken language translation, and also, uh, as a, a last but not least important task, uh, the automatic minuting. All of this uh, needs to be robust and efficient to guarantee the accessibility, the accessibility of the information. In, uh, and in a little, we currently we are in, at the middle, in the middle of the project uh, and uh, we have achieved a, let me say, important advance, advance uh, improvements in the technology. And we will apply these uh, improvements next year at the main uh, year, uh, event of the project uh, that will be the EuroSci 2021. It was supposed to be this year, but due to the COVID outbreak, uh, it has been uh, postponed to 2021. So uh, let me conclude this very brief introduction of the Your Bridge and the Leader projects uh, by recalling how the technology and the solution that we were talking about were almost pure sci-fi topics 30 years ago. So we are creating that future right now. And Marco already told this, and uh, the question is how to proceed and this, make these technologies more and more efficient, more and more advanced. I would like to uh, answer using uh, uh, the uh, utterance Professor Herman Ney used during the Eurobridge kickoff in uh, 2012. Uh, at the, uh, when he, the question was, uh, what do you need to uh, make the uh, technology advance? Uh, the answer was data, data, data. So uh, thank you everybody and uh, I will be glad to answer your question later. So let's continue this uh, overview of so many interesting projects. So we're actually back in this room with Marco Trombetti. Uh, if you just connected, he is the founder and CEO of Picampus and Translated. Picampus in particular is a VC fund for AI startup and it's the place where we are right now. And he will discuss a recent project on the European Parliament. So Marco, please. Uh, thank you, Simone. So, um, um, I will, I will try to do something um, uh, more fun. Here we have an incredible audience, and so talking about a project that already exists is something that I think is, uh, is interesting, but it's always very good to look what's next. So I will do a mix. Uh, so first, um, explain uh, what is going on uh, with European Parliament and, and this interesting project, and then we can see what may be the future um, in in this area so and show you a little demo of, of that so the european parliament is basically facing an important challenge where um, citizens member of the parliament and most importantly the deaf community would like to to interact with what's happening at the parliament 
And unfortunately, uh, using live interpreters that are brilliant and do a, an incredible work is not the best is not the best solution for someone with hearing problems. And and so having text is an incredible way to allow these people to understand what's going on. And so the, the, the project started with this main intent and he's almost a research project because he's something that lasts three years and, um, and so they're using uh, multiple vendors in parallel to test the solution and then at the end of the first year they will decide uh, which solution is actually the one that will stay for the longer term. And so it's about taking the audio from the microphones of the European Parliament, taking that audio stream, doing speech recognition, doing machine translation, deciding how to represent the information in a video so that people can interact. So different style of subtitling. And, and now is what Marco discussed, what um, Dario Franceschini discussed it, and is is really the results of what we've been working on over the last uh, uh, many years in research, and, and this is coming now to market as a product. Um, but I think so is an important step, and uh, is the first time that the European Parliament opened up to the AI, you know, and uh, many many people were scared inside the Parliament, you now thinking about the interpreters, but uh, I think that everybody is realizing how this is, is just creating a bigger impact. Uh, it's, not, it's not replacing the work of any interpreter, it's just adding another capacity, text. And it's, uh, it was designed for the people with hearing problems, but at the end it's for everyone. And think about uh, Facebook, for example, where most of the videos now are played, are viewed without audio because we are in a context where in mobility where we don't really want the audio if we don't have the earphones we don't want to have the audio on for everybody so subtitling text in general aid to video content is getting more and more important um, and so I, I see a nice future of, of these application further developments and, and the European Parliament as usual know, was a great uh, door openers and starter of this and, and remember that uh, the European Commission and the European Parliament started the research in machine translation back in, I think it was 1976 or something, like when I was born. So they have been very pioneers of this, and this is something very common in Europe because of the language diversity we have. So uh, we do have a problem, and so super happy that our institutions are attacking the problem. And it was with machine translation at that time, now it's with speech translation. And so this is the project release. It's a three-year project starting now, multiple vendors, and then one will continue with the solution. Um, but if we, I mean, but this was what we designed years ago in research. And now, so what could be next? So once we're able to, to look at the audio and recognize it, translate, so what, what's next? why don't we also teach machines to act and talk and express themselves with voice uh, in a similar way that the original speaker is doing? And so you know today we have text-to-speech technologies and basically they start with text, fax is text-to-speech, and from a text input they generate an audio. But what about if now we have an audio stream and then a text in another language, and we want to use these two information to generate a final audio. And so this is what we're, we're, we're doing in research right now uh, at, at uh, uh, Translated, but also with other partners with FPK, for example, in, in a few research projects. And so mostly working in, in the final part, and let's say the dubbing. Um, so I think what I would like to show to you is a small, short uh, section of a documentary where we basically took a Discovery Channel English content, 30 seconds, and we, we, we taught the machine to recognize the audio, translate, and then talk again, acting, and using the input of the original audio as one way to influence the text-to-speech model to produce an audio that is similar 
in the style of what is needed. And, and I'm, I'm, fortunately, the output is in Italian, but I think you will understand the, the, the prosody, the quality of the prosody. Uh, um, also, so for the Italian people that are listening, you may recognize the voice, uh, which is a famous Italian actor that we use it. And we're reproducing the voice uh, just for this research attempt. So it's not something that can be done. We don't have the license for, for that actor, but we're, we're showing what is possible in terms of also replicating um, a very known uh, uh, voice. So if we can get the, the audio going, and maybe the people that are in, in our conference on, on Skype may not be able to hear the audio, and, and I'm sorry about this, but the people uh, that are listening to the live stream will. So for, for Hassan um, and, and Dario, please, I, I would send you the link afterwards and the other people there. È la vigilia del capodanno cinese, di solito un giorno di festa di famiglia in Cina. Ma nel 2020, nella città centrale cinese di Wuhan, 9 milioni di persone sono in isolamento. Non possono lasciare la città e nessuno ha idea di quando la più grande quarantena della storia umana potrebbe finire. È un audace piano di battaglia per contenere il nuovo coronavirus, che ha già infettato più di 500 persone in Cina. Con i voli in uscita da Wuhan cancellati, centinaia di persone stanno volando verso la città. Essendo io un militare ho due categorie di persone che ammiro profondamente, i miei compagni di armi e i medici che vegliano su di noi. So that was a, a demonstration of actually this is not a human that was generated um, by by the machine. So very, so very promising end-to-end -end approach that we hope that will come into products um, very soon. So I wanted to give this update and and you know, move to the future since of our talk, not talking about only what has been delivered. That an AI has almost moved me <laughs> by hearing it. Very extremely good quality. So let's stay in this room. So we have our second to last project now. So Sebastian Bratier is the managing is the managing director in Pi School and the director of AI in Translated. And they're doing an incredible job in also AI education. So if you'd like to say a few words and projects about that. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Simone. So yeah, I wanted to, sp to speak about two uh, projects that we did at uh, Pi School to illustrate the fact that well, this is what we're speaking about here is cutting edge research, of course. Um, it's uh, also big projects that we've been uh, seeing. Um, the projects that we're speaking here are done at small scale and very fast. Uh, they are projects of eight weeks. Those who know Pi School a bit better, they know our format. So we have. Uh, uh, this um, uh, School of AI program we run several times a year where we have engineers, AI engineers from all over the world. We invite them and we hand over to them an AI challenge that we help them do within eight weeks um, and, and solve essentially. So um, Marco, maybe you can show the first slide of two. Um, this is one project that we did that uh, was run um, in 2018. It was one uh, that was financed eventually by the Azienda Sanitaria Regionale del Veneto, which is uh, the healthcare provider in the Veneto region in Italy, um, and also by Nuvo. Uh, the challenge here was to uh, look at uh, hospital dismissal letters. So you have one typical hospital dismissal letter on the left here, and label them with uh, treatments and diagnosis as can be extracted from the text of the letter. So this is a, a task that's called extreme text classification. It's extreme because the number of labels here is very high. It was something like 10,000 labels uh, for the ICD-9 classification that we used. And um, it's a problem because um, typically um, private clinics tend to what's, do what's called upcoding, which is using those codes which will bring them more money. And then the healthcare provider, which is a 
uh, social security, they need to check the uh, codes that have been used you know, to make sure that they're faithful to what's really happened and then apply the proper uh, refund. So we did this with um, uh, a model which is a variant of the transformer model which was published just one year before we did the project, turning this into a, a text labeling problem. And then um, we have this second project, Marco, yeah, thank you, uh, which was um, sponsored by Radio Dimensione Suono, which is a major broadcaster in Italy. We did this um, in um, last year in 2019 uh, um, in November and December. And so here what we want to do is we want to help the radio host who is picking topics to speak about for the next day. Um, help them find news, newsworthy uh, mentions, essentially. And, and here we use very similar tools, so I've picked these out because they're both NLP projects, of course, for tonight, but also because um, it's, quite, it's quite telling that they're both based on uh, the, 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 the transformer uh, model, which is work that was done um, by one of our, of our mentors, together with others, Wukash Kaiser from Google Brain, by the way. Um, and um, what was produced here was this uh, tool. It was delivered as a, as a Docker package that is now running at uh, RDS and produces these outputs. So again, um, small scale projects, but very intense and very focused. And I think that illustrates the kind of thing that we do at uh, Pi School. And uh, we're having not only a lot of fun, but I think we're also uh, pretty good at uh, sort of validating hypotheses for our sponsors here. Um, and helping them um, apply AI, like move from uh, research or science into production. Thank you, Sebastian. So let's go see for our last project what the US is doing, actually, because we have with us Hassan Sawaf. Yeah, until June 2020, if you don't know Hassan, he was the director of AI in Facebook, and before that, he led several teams in Amazon. He founded the Artificial Intelligence Lab in eBay and a lot of other things that I don't have time to mention. And today we have him with us to talk about one of his latest projects, AI Explain. So, Hassan. Thank you very much. So, uh, I hope you guys can hear me. I mean, I had issues with uh, the visual feedback. So, I'm going to be talking about um, um, informally, without slides, um, um, about the project which we started at um, at Amazon, um, and then basically the continuation of uh, what I'm doing now. There's some kind of echo coming in. So, so uh, in uh, in end of uh, 2019, uh, beginning of 2020, we worked on a project to do um, uh, speech recognition, uh, uh, dubbing um, for video content. And um, I mean, we heard it from Marco and Marco and from uh, others from the, from the panel. I mean, what the challenges are, what the solutions are, uh, or what potential solutions can be, and we t we heard about stacked approach. We heard about end-to-end -end approaches, which is uh, which are all very good. Something in if you look at the um, or at the practical use of um, speech translation, in, in in particular with the speech-to-speech -speech, uh, tasks in in the content of in the context of dubbing is. Um, uh, which, which we need to um, consider are things like uh, um, time alignment. We want, we want um, speech translation to happen in such a way that um, when a person is speaking, the, uh, the translation can happen in speech back, but it should be only as long as the actual speaker is speaking. And unfortunately, as you guys know, if you do translations to express the same content, in different languages might take you a little longer or a little shorter time, which comes to be a very awkward, awkward visual feedback where you basically see a person still moving their lips while the translation was done. Or the other way around, the person stopped moving their lips and then basically there's still voice coming back, which is a very awkward, uh, awkward uh, uh, problem. Um, also something else which um, um, I think uh, I think it was Andrea mentioned is uh, super important is if we're 
talking about the contextual contextually how the voice is gonna sound if you are in a room and you are talking it's gonna be sounding different than if you're outside in a large hall etc so the rev reverberation is going to be an important component as well so if you take all these aspects and add them to basically the diversity of accents and languages and multilinguality and all of that the challenge basically increases by time so when i started that project with uh, marcello and amazon uh, marcello federico uh, who led the project later on um, i basically posed the problem to be uh, we, we, that we want basically to drop in a video and the video should actually be split into um, audio which is spoken, audio, which is the background information, maybe different speakers, and then basically figuring out on how to do the translation so that it fits exactly in, this, in the slots where the spoken, spoken words were happening, transitioning over prosodic, uh, knowledge, uh, prosodic information, things like emotions should be expressed in the target similar to the source, and uh, basically mix basically the split out music or noises in the background with the, with the text-to-speech output, which ha should have the same reverberation like uh, at the end of the, the, the source uh, um, um, audio in the translated output and so forth. So we did a few experiments. We worked on different approaches, whether it is a stacked approach and then whether it is an end-to-end -end approach, and we faced exactly those issues which uh, were mentioned by marco before data is a huge is a huge problem if you basically have these extra dimensions it's 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 even a bigger problem so we decided that um, um, a stacked approach might be a faster path to to solution not because it's the best path because we assume that an end-to-end -end approach is going to be the best path but it's a it's a it's a good path to to get um, to the solution. So the result of that right now um, you can read in a paper. We have it on archive. You can basically download it and read up on some of the experiments. Um, we can actually also present some uh, demos on this one. So this is one. The future of this is going to be also in addition to um, visual. Uh, uh, um, audio input you can actually make use of the visual input as well as well as visual output think about um, the person who is being dubbed maybe we can actually take their voice generate um, generate the same text to speech with the original voice so brad pitt should be talking in chinese with his own voice back so to say so and te technology is uh, theoretically available for this, and um, we are doing some research um, in, in these fields um, to continue that. That's one. The other thing is maybe we can actually even adjust some of the facial, uh, facial features of the speaker so that it matches closer to what the text-to-speech um, would generate. So this is basically future research, super high risk, but if if gen if we can solve that those problems, I think we have a we have a huge uh, benefit for the for the world at the end of the day by basically breaking down even more language barriers than we we are uh, breaking now. So this is one project which I want to talk to uh, about, and then the other project is um, a company you guys might have heard about, AppTech, which is working on. Um, um speech uh it's not speech translation really so it's um simultaneous translation of asl so um, uh, american sign language and how that can be translated into speech which is uh, also uh, um, which is also a, a very very interesting uh, approach the problem with asl is there's barely any data out there, unfortunately. So there's not much data out there. So we need to basically deal with ASL similar to the um, low resource languages. Then the input is a visual input. So we're taking basically ASL, the uh, um, like uh, the post, po uh, post uh, 
for Kodak posture detection and identification activity detection as input, which is um, um, similar to speech recognition, uh, very um, uh, error. Um, I mean, errors can be very much um, part of the part of the input and make it uh, make it uh, uh, um, make it um, English translated into English and uh, make do it as a text to speech. This is also field of research which um, we are super um, engaged in and very uh, interested in doing this um, to basically bring together the fringes of our society back into the center with us so that we have every everyone much more integrated with each other so even in the same country sometimes you are not focusing on the fringe societies which is not the right thing we need to like pull them in aptech is working on that project so these are two projects now talking about that um, I um, after I left Amazon and I went to Facebook and we worked on um, um, uh, uh, multimodal input and uh, processing computer vision and speech recognition and language and reasoning and other things I decided to start my, uh, my a new company and um, basically um, the shell of the the charter of that company is to push these high risk high value projects even further forward so we are um, supporting now um, my old friends as well as new friends um, pushing forward um, research and making making it um, come to come closer to uh, production uh, than than before and uh, we want to not uh, we want to basically enable small companies and medium-sized companies to have basically the same kind of muscle in ai like uh, amazon and um, facebook has and so forth so uh, and we're doing that in collaboration with a lot of companies um, and we're looking, I mean, I'm always selling that to my friends that he, um, and uh, part of that would be here in the network. We want to put our hands together to solve these hard problems. Um, so um, we're looking for more projects to collaborate with and we're looking also for more scientists to like put our hands together and work and benefit from a full democratization of uh, what AI is. So um, every, every person with a problem and every person who wants to solve a problem should basically be connected through, through a, a platform which we are building so that we can, uh, we can scale better and faster and so forth. So that's basically what Explain is, a marketplace for AI resources. Um, we just started two and a half months ago. Uh, we already have close to 40 projects and we have something like 500 or so scientists which are putting their hands together and working on some really, really exciting projects and we're looking forward to seeing more of these. That's uh, a little bit of past, future and what we are working on today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hassan. So I think this was an incredible overview of what is going on right now in the world. Now we are in the last part of this event, so I'd like to uh, use our speaker to understand a little bit more about, from all we have seen, what's the future of speech translation and what's the future of NLP more in general. So I know dinner is approaching, we are running a little bit short on time, so I'd like to ask the speaker to be uh, short, with, I mean, as short as they can be with the answers, but if you want to interact with the other speakers, please do. So our uh, fir my first question is actually to our last speaker. So Paolo Paravento is the CEO of Pair Voice, which is now part of the Alma Wave group. And my question for Hi, him... Simona. Hi, Paolo. Guys. So my question is, uh, well, we heard a lot today about how we can put these technologies for general use, actually. And something we hear about a lot is conversational AI right now. So uh, putting these mm. in the real world in an interactive way. So do you think this is a, um, a promising research direction? What's the future of conversational AI? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, question, uh, Simone. Um, well, uh, let me say, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, you know, uh, is uh, one of the 
uh, most important um, uh, IT trade that will uh, impact uh, the, the real life in the future, okay? Uh, but in uh, all the um, area, uh, in the market or in uh, personal life, uh, we have a study from analysts that uh, affirmed that uh, within uh, 2023, 35% of workers will have started working with bots or other forms of intelligence, artificial intelligence. This is not only a IT problem, but also a social problem, because it will be important to learn how to manage cooperation and not how to compete between men and a machine. But this means increasing um, and creating a new opportunity for the new generation, because a lot of things will be automated, but a lot of new jobs will, uh, will be created. Um, uh, the the uh, analyst says also that uh, by uh, 2022, 60% of European and American company will use uh, artificial intelligence. But uh, to do uh, what? To integrate artificial intelligence in its own uh, business process uh, using uh, legacy data real-time operational data and third-party data. So in such a case, the problem that uh, Marco Asana has described and Dario as a, a lack of data, this will be um, managed in the industries because uh, working on a specific vertical um, uh, business process, you will be able uh, to collect the real data directly from the customer or from uh, its own uh, uh, final, uh, final client. Uh, please uh, image a speech analytic solution that are able to collect a phone call, transcribe a phone call, and to get um, uh, information from the voice of the customer. So the game, uh, from my point of view, will be played uh, about uh, the process transformation, the digital transformation, that we are talking in digital revolution, we will um, see um, artificial intelligence that will impact a lot of business area and services like field service management. Imagine that you have a, a company with um, operation uh, to the final customer, you can uh, automatize or use um, uh, virtual agent uh, to manage the, the service on the field. Uh, but this is not the, the future. Uh, this is a um, uh, reality now. We have um, um, we have developed a platform for um, railway uh, companies, and actually we are able to um, uh, support the, the people to automatically um, make inspection on the on the train and the other um, uh, facilities and equipment, like a contact center. This is another area that will be heavily impacted by conversational agent. Um, but not only with um, uh, natural language IVR, let me say, uh, intelligent uh, agent, but also with, um, in my uh, idea, with speech language translation machine, because image that a human or a bot uh, will be able to um, uh, take in charge a call from a customer that uh, speak in other languages. So an English guys that speak with an uh, Italian uh, operator in a call center, but the Italian operator speak in Italian and the, um, the customer speak in English. This is another uh, benefit that uh, spoken language translation machine or artificial intelligence will impact business process. So the real life and the reason why the customer wants to invest on in this technology, because in the back end of each of this process, uh, you have a business case that make feasible the initiatives, okay? Media monitoring, the way in which you monitor all the uh, TV and radio in the world in order to uh, create a sort of a Google in the um, uh, television, uh, in order to provide insight to um, uh, media monitoring company, to advertising company, etc. Et Healthcare is another area that will be uh, affected by artificial intelligence. So a lot of these guys, of this area, business area, that uh, will be all uh, in, 
impacted by the uh, artificial intelligence and by the uh, virtual agent uh, and uh, other uh, other stuff like chatbot too. So thank you, Paolo. Area. Thank you. Sorry. But our channel. Pa pa sorry, point, I, I have to cut point. you a little bit last short point because we. So, okay. Thanks. That's when the finish. Uh, the ch real challenge is to better manage uh, the interaction uh, between a bot and uh, people uh, and uh, provide them a transparent, a consistent user experience through different touch points. This is the real challenge from an uh, industry point of view. Thank you. So uh, before continuing with the panel, I'd like uh, to remind you that our uh, feed is still active. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the social channel. We're trying to stay in sync and uh, try to ask as many questions as we can. So, okay, I, I, I guess we, we got a great overview on how we can make these technologies uh, available to everyone. But of course, another key point that we heard is that we need data to do that. We need actually a lot of data. So uh, I'd like to go back to Marco Turki for a second question, which is, can we use synthetic data to, can, can we create data to, help us in the adoption of these technologies. Marco? I, yes, I think we should, because uh, this system that we are talking about here are very data hungry. And there is evidence that the more data you use, the better the system can work. And uh, for some tasks, uh, the industry has the data, but sometimes it's not possible to share. So we need to find some way to uh, produce data. And uh, yes, my answer is yes, we need to work on generating better synthetic data. Just to give you an example, the system that uh, perform on part of the cascade, the majority of the data are synthetic data, where you generate this is the start from the description and you generate the translation. And this is the only way if you want to train this competitive system. So yes, sometimes it's difficult. And sometimes you need to use other machines to generate the data that they have uh, uh, poor performance. But uh, this is one of the big uh, requirements from this new artificial intelligence method. I'm short, so I leave the floor to the other speaker for other question. Thank you. So, okay, so you said it yourself. So performance and evaluation. So this is, I think, another key point in this area. So we need a lot of data, but then you need a way to uh, understand how much progress you are made, which is not trivial in artificial intelligence, actually. So I'd like to ask uh, Laurent Bessassier, uh, since you show also some graphs, you, you had this blue score on your slides. I mean, how difficult is it to really evaluate whether we are making progress? So um, evaluation is a very broad uh, domain in NLP, so I think um, my answer will go back to um, the main task that was presented today, which is a spoken language translation. And yes, for spoken language translation, systems are, are mostly evaluated with uh, automatic metrics such as blue. But as it was shown in Marco's presentation, there are some attempts to go further with human evaluation to fairly compare models such as Cascade versus end-to-end -end models. And I think also um, the analysis of some specific, um, the translation of some specific phenomena is very important and interesting. So um, translating, uh, translating pronouns was an example shown, but there is also some language pair which have very challenging uh, problems, uh, especially if you, if you are interested in uh, online simultaneous translation, the, the, the scenarios that I have talked about um, a, a few minutes before. So for instance, if you translate from German language in the source, in the source uh, since German has this verb final um, case, uh, then uh, for it's a very uh, important challenge for for um, simultaneous translation. So we need very uh, we need better metrics that correlate way, well with uh, human judgments, and they are still needed. And now, if I focus more on the simultaneous translation task uh, or simultaneous interpretation, uh, its evaluation is also, I think, an open domain. Uh, we have seen uh, in the graph I've presented that there is a trade-off between latency and blue, but we do not know much about uh, which latency is acceptable in real use and which trade-off is, uh, is needed. 
So I think uh, in the near future uh, for uh, spoken language translation and spoken language interpretation, it's important to work closely with uh, human interpreters, for instance, and try to collect real data and evaluate our systems uh, in real conditions. Um, this is, uh, I think, a second aspect. And maybe uh, in one more minute, so last but not least, uh, as far as speech-to-speech -speech translation is concerned, so we had uh, the speech generation on top of the speech-to-text translation, uh, then its evaluation is also an open problem. Uh, so there are several questions like, can we evaluate speech-to-speech um, -speech translation using automatic metrics? Uh, if yes, uh, how can we do that? Uh, can we set up evaluation protocols in order to evaluate the usability of speech-to-speech -speech translation, especially in a real uh, conversational interaction situation? So, uh, to conclude, I want to say that the evaluation of, of such technologies like spoken language translation is still um, uh, an open problem and is a, a real uh, sub-area of research we should focus on as well. Okay, thanks. So uh, let's continue with a little, a few questions. So um, one, one thing we actually, so we, we saw that there are a lot of big companies right now investing in this. So we have more data, we have more hardware, uh, and we are seeing some really actually huge models. One that was discussed quite a lot recently was OpenAI language model, actually, OpenGPT3. Uh, it was at least on my Twitter, it was all over Twitter for like two months. So Sebastian, maybe you want to discuss this. I mean, how big is the impact of this kind of huge models on NLP? Okay, that's a, yeah, that's a big one, a, a big question as well as a very big model, I guess. Uh, so I'll, I'll try and give you a bit of context uh, for those of our audience who, who, who might not have heard that much about, about OpenAI and GPT-3. And then I'll try and speak out impact a bit. So let's see. So GPT-3 is a really big, uh, what's called a language model. A language model is something that essentially a neural network, a, a big uh, system that knows about the statistics of language. And the one task that um, this GPT-3 model was uh, good at was uh, producing language, so generating text, essentially. And um, it, uh, it had four runners, so this is GPT-3, there was GPT-2 and GPT-1 before that. Um, GPT-3 came out, uh, I think, in June, right? So just before the summer. Um, and it's, I think it's currently the largest single artificial neural network in the world. It's got 175 billion parameters. That we know about. That we know about, public exactly. Some, uh, uh, public. <laughs> public. We're, we're brewing some stuff on our computers here that I'm not telling you about, I'm just joking. Um, no, it's, it's huge. I mean, yeah, 175 billion parameters, I said, and that's 10 times as big as the previous uh, state of the art in terms of big models. That was a model from Microsoft. I was called uh, Turing NLG, also for natural language generation. Um, and what's astonishing about GPT-3, I guess, is, and that's astonished, you know, not just um, insiders from the machine learning world or NLP world, but, but astonished everyone who's looked at it, is the realism of the text it produces. Uh, it's, um, it's in uh, many tasks. It's indistinguishable by humans themselves. It's indistinguishable from human-produced human text. So it reads just as fluently. Uh, sometimes it will, uh, make some, it will produce some um, falsehoods, but fluently. So it will say some non-true statements but in, uh, in a way that is, is, very, uh, is very readable. And what's amazing from a technical point of view about uh, GPT-3, I guess, is that whereas uh, previously language models, in order to do anything useful with them, you needed to do uh, that thing. A bit better with that microphone. OK, cool. You needed to do that thing that's called fine tuning. Um, in order to, to do something sensible. Well, with GPT-3, essentially, it's seen um, all the text on the web. It's seen uh, 500 billion tokens. It's seen what's called this common crawl corpus, especially. And so um, um, 
what's, uh, what's a bit magic about it is that it can do what's called zero-shot uh, prediction. So you can, you can ask it questions or you can uh, start some text or you can put together a kind of trick question and it will answer um, based just on producing a continuation of the text that you have uh, given as input. And so that's the task of zero-shot. It's also very good at what's called one-shot and few-shot where you give it examples of what you want to, to produce in terms of tasks. It can also it can do uh, translation as well. So you tell it um, uh, pear translates to poire in French, and then table translates to table, and then what does uh, cheese translate to, and it will answer fromage. So it does all of this and then much, much more. Um, impact comes from the fact that Many people for the first time have realized what these very, very big models are capable of and how close they come to what we as humans can do. This is by no means uh, the end of it, obviously. There's a, an approximate doubling time in terms of model size. It's 3.4 months. So that means that uh, presumably within two or three years, we'll have models that are, if we do the analogy with the human brain, um, so we have, we have about 100 trillion synapses and um, so we've got this model with about 175 billion parameters so then an order of magnitude of 1000 only separating us humans from this kind of model uh, with a doubling time of 3.4 months uh, in model size you can do the math it's easy it will be I mean they, they I can't call it the singularity but uh, getting there um, in two, three years, where the size of the model is uh, almost the size of the human brain. Um, and we'll probably have many more insights along the way of what human intelligence uh, actually means and how it uh, is uh, distinguishable from artificial intelligence, at least as long as this, tr this trend goes. Well, this would lead to a great question about general artificial intelligence, but I'm keeping this for last. So actually, I have another question on this because uh, we see these huge models, huge data sets, but um, some people say that in Europe, we are like putting some barriers because we have some very, very strong privacy laws actually. So if you compare with uh, China or the US, we have a lot more interest into protecting privacy. We know about the GDPR, for example. So the question would be, and it's for um, uh, Dario, uh, whether this, how, how can you, um, does GDPR that actually have an impact into how Euro Europe can do research in these thematics, themes, and is it the right way forward? Thank you for the question. Uh, and as you said, data collection, but also data uh, usage is a, a tough matter. In uh, GDPR has been an important milestone for uh, data privacy regulation uh, in Europe. Uh, as far as I know, similar laws uh, are being discussed also in other countries in order to regulate the uh, data access, the data usage uh, for the privacy. And uh, we had a, a discussion in the, during the ELITER project uh, regarding the uh, GDPR and the ways to access this data. Uh, so for example, uh, as part of the project, uh, we have regular calls uh, and uh, everybody uh, provided the uh, agreement to use this data for research purposes, uh, but obviously it's uh, a really small amount of data that, is, uh, uh, that we can collect and that we can use as part of the project. Uh, so uh, we had a discussion uh, during the project review meeting uh, regarding this topic uh, and uh, also because it's uh, important to collect data from uh, real life so it's uh, important to be used to use uh, data that is collected uh, for example from uh, real conversation uh, if we need to improve uh, the conversation the technology in the conversational domain uh, it's uh, essential to have this data. So uh, the major point uh, here is that uh, obviously uh, we, the, the owner of the, the uh, enterprise or the research project that needs to access the data needs to ask permission 
to, uh, to get the data before uh, starting the recording, for example. So, first of all, it's important to get the uh, agreement of the, end, of the owner of the data, the customer, to be able to collect the data. And then, uh, if it is, it is not possible right now to provide data as is, let's think of, uh, for example, speech recordings. Uh, speech recordings uh, uh, may contain uh, uh, private information, uh, such as uh, name, uh, last names, uh, some other information. And to be able to share these data, these recordings uh, to research projects uh, would require anonymization, not only in the content, in the terms of, that are uh, named entities that are uh, relevant for privacy issues, but also uh, modifying the signal, so morphing, applying morphing to the audio. And these two uh, requirements uh, would make this data pretty useless for such purposes, because uh, the morphing, for example, makes data useless for speech recognition training because it uh, modifies uh, the signal. So, uh, just to go back to the question, uh, is data collection and uh, data storage useless? The answer is no, it is not useless. Uh, it's, I would say it's important to uh, provide information to the final user that the data uh, has been collected uh, and uh, it is important that uh, enterprises uh, collect this data uh, now, start collecting this data now and managing this data now, because this data maybe cannot be used today because uh, of the uh, privacy uh, regulations, but this could be made available to research purposes in a few years. So starting the collection now will make huge amount of data available in a few years once the privacy obligation has lapsed. So I have to apologize because we have a huge number of questions from the live audience and we're not able to answer uh, all of them. So I'm just choosing a few of them that are quite interesting. Any, any of our speakers is free to answer. It's actually the first question was quite interesting because someone is asking about the CO2 impact, so the environmental impact of all these huge training and huge data sets. So, yeah, I, I, I can answer that because as you now we've been thinking about this recently and we just calculated that training one single language pair for our machine translation model uh, is the equivalent of a car driving 2,000 kilometers, okay? And if you take the GPT-3 model, $12 million investment, that's really a big, big ship doing a cruise all over the world. So there is a, um, there is a problem there, and uh, our strategy of going there for a bigger model all the time uh, is is um, is not sustainable at one point. And so if, if we say we will go and expand AI to many fields and use it everywhere, then we're creating a quite a big problem. Smaller than, than blockchain and Bitcoin, but still, still significant. So I think uh, there should be discussion in how we use our brains to make things more efficient. Um, I think that's a very, very good question. And I think should, we should start as soon as we can a discussion in how we, we change before we're going to create a problem bigger than what we solve. Thanks. So actually a few other questions were really um, very specific topics, so I'm going to merge them. There's a lot of talk recently, especially on OpenGPT3 and similar models on self-supervision. So do we really need the... Uh, how much label the data do we need? So how much curation do we need from the data? Or can we train these kind of huge models uh, just for, from some weak kind of form of supervision? So we saw that we can do something similar from text. Can we also do it for this kind of simultaneous translation or speech translation or speech recognition? So any speaker? Hassan, maybe? 
Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Um, uh, yes, we can do uh, self supervision for speech as well, um, and uh, basically using very very similar architectures and what is done for for text. And yes, for spoken language translation, we we have done some preliminary experiments that will be published uh, next month at InterSpeech, and it's possible to improve the learning curves of the model by using uh, self-supervised pre-trainings of models. So it's definitely something that should be uh, uh, investigated more and more for for speech as well. Uh, I. I have one last question, so for Hassan actually. So we heard a lot about challenges and way forwards for NLP and speech translation, automatic speech translation, and how this could actually uh, give a slight way forward to general artificial intelligence. So how do you see the future of speech translation since you've worked there for so many decades? So what do you see in the next 10 years? I think um, so. I think uh, modalities are gonna uh, gonna start merging, and uh, we're we're gonna be looking into more science where whether the modality in a written form or in a spoken form or a visual input, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are gonna be uh, coming closer to each other. I think that's something which I'm uh, super excited about. Uh, that that. Uh, things are coming the way the same way that like we humans learn taking in all the signals at once and basically making use of that to uh, go closer to uh, a world understanding what is around what is happening around us and predicting what can i do what can i understand uh, what can i uh, what can i act on whether in whether in dialogue whether in speech translation or translation in general, speech language, speech text or um, or multimodal content, I think th those are things which are uh, coming. And um, I mean, these models which are trained, uh, like GPT three and and others, uh, which are learned with the weekly weekly um, supervised data or uh, no supervision at all. Um, um, or, or self-supervision to some extent um, um, are definitely um, just stepping stones to to the large vision of being able to like put an AI in there, feed it all kinds of videos which we have, and basically give us a, give us something which we can ask um, intelligent questions against and uh, get good uh, good answers to. I think this is, uh, I mean, with all the challenges, I think we're the speed of um, improvement of where, where we are in AI and machine learning is, uh, is uh, drastic. And I'm excited to see the next two to five years where we get with, with all this. Well, since we're mentioning artificial intelligence, I have one last tricky question for each speaker. So it's, I'm taking, so how many years left to general artificial intelligence? So if these self-supervised models work, if we can merge modalities, if we can embed them in the field. So just five seconds answer for everyone. So Sebastian. Oh my goodness. Uh, I think uh, I'll see it before I'm dead. Maybe uh, I'm 40, maybe 42. So maybe I'll live another 40 years. Maybe I'll see it before I'm dead. I need you to be a little more precise, better than the average human or the top 10% of humans? An adolescent. The? Better than an 18 year old. 18 year old, average 18 year old. Then we need the computation to be bigger than the human brain. And with the current Moore law that will be in, in about 15 years, we need the algorithm to be learning as good as the human brain and that probably is going to happen in in the same time and then we need to feed machines with as much as information as a human receives in his life and as a pre-training from from the past from the genetic that we receive and that that uh, that, that will not happen because i think that we will not have the interest in doing that because we have no interest in replicating something that is not perfect. And so maybe we will focus our attention to build something with 
less source of information, but being able to use that superpower and learning power and computation to do something better than humans do, still on some verticals. And we're not efficient for all the tasks that we need. So I think that by our choice, we will not make something that looks like a human. Well, let's see if everyone agrees. So Marco, Turki, let's see. Well, I want to be a bit more optimist than Marco. And uh, uh, for me, the big problem is how to evaluate these things, to understand if it's really equal to human. That's for me is a big challenge. Uh, by when we'll be able to have it? Uh, I think in 20 years, in some, uh, in some scenario, we can see something that can approximate human quite well. But uh, the problem is then to generalize this to all possible conditions. And then probably I need to admit that Marco is right. Let's see if everyone in, in Italy agrees. Paolo? He's gone. Dario? Um, let me just uh, uh, recall uh, what I mentioned earlier. Uh, we are now living in a world where uh, uh, we are used to use technology uh, that uh, 30 years ago was uh, sci fiction. So, what now is sci fiction, I think, will be uh, the reality in 30 to 40 years. So, uh, I think that uh, real AI will be uh, deployed in between uh, in uh, 30 to 40 years. Laurent? Um, maybe the more we will approach uh, human intelligence, the more we will bother by some uh, default of the artificial intelligence, like the uncanny valley for, um, for human robotics, for instance. So I think it's a never ended story because even if we approach a lot, um, at some point, uh, there will be some details that will bother us a lot as well. So that's, I'm, I'm a bit less optimistic. Hassan, okay, now it's the time where you tell us that Facebook already has a, an AI <laughs> hidden. <laughs> No, I think I think um, I, I think I see it the same way like uh, Marco uh, um, that um, I think in twenty years it's realistic to have something. Now, the, does that mean that we are basically replaceable? Uh, I think uh, I agree with Marco that it's probably not. Um, we're we're gonna be using AI in very specific domains and stuff like that. I mean, we're we're always talking about the general AI. I mean, I'm not sure if this is this is something which we really need to strive for. I mean, we are we need we need an AI which understands to solve a specific problem. Most of the times, that's basically what it is. No one cares about a general AI for their for the sake of general generality. I mean, that's not what's the point. Um, so I think, uh, I think in 20 years, I mean, I had, I had this question before in the mid nineties and someone asked me, how long is it going to take until the machine translation is going to be uh, very good and so forth. And I said 30 years and it was like 22 years from that point onwards. And, um, I think we're going to have a similar situation with, uh, gen general AI for specific, for specific domains. Yeah. Okay, we're going from the balance to the pessimistic. We can see we have a lot of uh, technical people here. <laughs> Next time we need uh, someone that can say like five years. So, <laughs> okay, I think it was an incredible, very interesting uh, panel and a very interesting keynote. So I'd like to thank all our speakers and leave the er the word to Marco for our closing statements. Thank you so much, Simone, for this great moderation. And so I, I want to thank also all the participants, all the speakers, and all the people that have watched this video and will be watching this video in, in the next months. Um, Pi Campus want to be the place uh, for all the people that believe that we should be using AI to support humanity rather than replacing it. And we really welcome all the people that would like to join our community in this effort. So. Uh, keep uh, be connected with us 
And after COVID, please come back and come to visit us uh, to our campus in Rome. Uh, you will be uh, very welcome. And uh, I hope to end another have another session like this uh, soon. Thank you all. Bye, Aaron.